Welcome to the Busted Fighters Repaired Daily Podcast. On Busted Fighters, we discuss sports medicine topics important to MMA athletes, their doctors, therapists, trainers, and coaches. Our guests tell their story of recovery from a specific injury, what worked for them, what didn't, and why. I'm your host, Matt Colby. I'm a chiropractic sports physician, and I focus on the problems MMA athletes run into during training, fight camps, and competition. Today, I'm here with my friends, Tom Ullman, Matt Andrade, and our guest, Aaron A. Train Simpson. He had an 11-fight UFC career, but you might not know he went 142-1 and as a wrestler in high school, ended up passing on a scholarship to Nebraska, walked on at Arizona State, earned a scholarship, and ended up finishing with the 12th most wins in ASU history. He still coaches fighters here in Phoenix. Today's topic was AC joint separation of the shoulder, which Aaron experienced recently. We discussed uh, how to make yourself more comfortable when you have this injury and ways to treat it. Um, I think we learned a lot and I think you will too. So here it is, Aaron A. Trey Simpson. So Aaron, uh, what, what, we, what I'd like to talk about first before we get into injuries is what was it like with the four of you, um, Cain Velasquez, C.B. Dalloway, yourself, and uh, Ryan Bader at ASU? Because of course you, you guys were all American wrestlers, but MMA wasn't what it is now back then. Did you guys see your lives going into MMA, going in this crazy direction, into this crazy sport? A lot of people get confused that I was in school with Bader, CB, and Kane. Um, uh, I was their coach. I probably hung out with them too much, like we were on the same team. Right, but right. Um, I, it, you know, I was there earlier. So I was I, when I was at ASU in my college days. That was in the the, the mid '90s, and that's when the UFC really started. I guess not take off, but that's when it really started. Um, and so I remember watching it, Kevin Jackson, who was my coach at the time, he fought in the UFC. Um, and we were all, in fact, we all had a big pay-per-view party at my house and to watch Kevin fight. And we all went nuts when he had his first victory or whatever. So I remember thinking like, God, I wonder if, you know, I could do, I think I could do that. And that, that, that'd be, a, you know, somewhat exciting. And we had a couple other guys that, that did, you know, that, that, uh, Rage in the Cage scene was going around that time, mm -hmm. and so I went and watched a couple, and it was just insane. You mm -hmm. saw guys like Homer Moore going out there and beating people up, and and, I, and they were just pulling people off bar stools, and then you want to sign up to fight. You know, that was back in the in the heyday of, like, no-holds-barred fighting before really rules. Um, I remember thinking, it's nuts. I could do that, but no way in hell would I get, in, you know, and would I do that, especially for, mm -hmm. you know, 100 bucks or whatever mm -hmm. it was, or free drinks, whatever those guys were fighting for. Um, but you fast forward into mid 2000s and it's going on now and and here you know i'm coaching kane cb and bader and i was the upper weights coach so i you know i guess lucky to be able to uh to be a coach amongst those three guys as well as some other guys that came through like cliff starks um some of these other upper weights that ended up you know finding their way into the ufc but i was the the fourth to think about it kane was the first we knew kane was going to fight his senior year um, he, we, we thought he was going to be able to get in the finals of the NCAA tournament and possibly win it. He had a tough guy in Steve Mako who ended up kind of fighting. Um, Cole Conrad beat him in the semifinals. Cole was a Bellator champ at one time, so there was another guy that fought. But we knew Kane was going to fight. Um, and he, that dude was, was just maybe one of the most intense and hardest workers I've ever seen. That's a lot to say for a heavyweight. Usually they're just big, cuddly teddy bears, you know, mm -hmm. or every once in a while you get a, a, a nut that outtrains everybody. But Kane was that nut. Um, so he was kind of started at Arizona Combat Sports. Tom Ortiz got him in touch with um, with AKA Dwayne Zinkin, who was at, who was out in uh, Fresno, California, and got him over to, to California. So really, as soon as he graduated, he was off to, to San Jose, that area, to train at AKA. Whereas Bader and CB went to Arizona Combat Sports and were staying there and training. And then I left ASU, um, and it's kind of weird because that summer. I got contacted by uh, by by uh, Tito Ortiz to go up and do his, to help him during his training camp. So we went up to Big Bear, and like I'm sitting in in uh, De La Hoya's house, but he was like, I don't know if, if Tito bought De La Hoya, Oscar De La Hoya's house up there in Big Bear. So like there are two houses. Tito had the main one with he and Jenna Jameson, and mm -hmm. then me and some of the other coaches and, and trainer and 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 training partners were in the other house, and I'm sitting there. Still coaching at ASU. It's a summer. I'm working, finishing up my master's degree, and um, helping Tito get ready for this fight. And he asked me to corner him and, and be a part of it. And it was really a, a cool experience. But yet, I had never, you know, I had not fought at all besides just being able to wrestle at a high level. Um, 
And so I, you know, I spend that time, spend a month up there, go watch Tito um, lose to, um, oh God, no, I can't think of his name, Rashad Evans. Um, it was a good fight, but, but Rashad ended up beating him. Um, it was close. So fast forward, then I get back down to the Valley, I leave ASU and start training. Um, and I actually was going back and forth to Cal Poly and, and coaching on their squad. Mm -hmm. So I'd go every, every month for like 10 days and coach the Cal Poly University team with Sammy Henson and some of those guys, but still training with Bader and CB, but not really to fight, more to like be the wrestling coach at, at ECS. Mm -hmm. So I'm about maybe a month into to doing that. And, and, uh, and I kind of think, so I think, God, I can do this. You know, I'm still, I just got done really in 2005, Russell, at the world team trials. And that was like my last year to, to compete, um, to try to make a world team. And so I'm still in shape. I'm still moving pretty good. Now it's 2007, 2008. And I decide I'm going to do it. Well, they come to me and they say, you want to fight down in the Cayman Islands? And I'm, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> like a month into training. And, trip. and by the way, is it heavyweight? And I was weighing 200 pounds. And. And, and Bader had fought down there before, and he goes, dude, you got to go down there. It's unbelievable. You get to go to this island. They, they fly you in. They, they're going to pay you $5,000 to beat up these guys that don't train. They're just going to get in a cage, and they, you know, they've seen it on, the, you know, they've seen it on mm -hmm. TV a little bit. So I go down with Jamie Varner, um, Ray Steinbeis, and we, it, it's, it's hilarious. Like, we make this trip down there, and, and I step in the cage and fight this guy who comes out. He's probably 230 pounds, a little... A little uh, I don't know, Kamen, uh, uh, Cayman Islander? And he <laughs> Kamenian? Just, yeah, Kamenian, me, that is. <laughs> he's swinging away at me, and I'm kind of shitting myself, you know, <laughs> like, how do I, and I just, like, double the guy and slammed him and just started, like, mm -hmm. hitting him with these teeny little punches and, like, hoping the referee pulls me off of this mm -hmm. guy because I don't know what I'm doing, really. And then he gets up, and I slam again. Like, I don't, I think I might have got hit once, but it, it took me probably two and a half minutes to, to get pulled off of the guy, and after slamming him probably five times, that's the most damage I did was just slamming him. Because I, I'm telling you, like when I, I probably threw a hundred straight like one two one twos mm -hmm. to his face and did mm -hmm. zero damage. But I'm like the whole time I'm looking at the ref like, yeah. hey, you gonna pull me off? Please stop this. <laughs> Please stop. It's kind this. of deflating yeah. too if you're just punching him and he's not reacting. You're yeah. like, shit, I'm not letting this guy out. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it was like. Yeah, I didn't. If I knew how to really throw a punch at that time, her, I, I could have. I didn't know any submissions. I just, I just wanted to get in and out of there as fast as possible and enjoy the island. But yeah, that was my first experience in a, maybe a month into training. That might have been the original Fight Island. That could and should be the original Fight yeah. Island. I saw, awesome. I saw that. I think it was your second fight ever was down in Rocky Point, oh, Mexico. God, yeah. Rocky. <laughs> for those of you not here in Arizona, Rocky Point, Mexico is. Phoenix's like quick vacation spot, two two and a half hours away. It's in not the, Cancun. In yeah, <laughs> in the Sea of right at the corner of the Sea of Cortez, and it is not Cancun. No, it's it's a fun place to go to. I have a lot of friends who have fought down there, but not in a cage. Well, people go down there and cause trouble. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, you get arrested. I've actually seen. I had to pull a couple of buddies out of the uh, the jail one day out of, out of there, which was strange. But yeah, Rocky Point was what three and a half miles mm -hmm. or three and a half hours south of us, and that was another thing where I'm like. What am I doing? I have a master's degree. I, at that point, we, I, I, had, I had twins on the way that were going to be born, and I'm, and I got a, we got a call like a one week notice to go down. So me and Todd Lally drive down to, to Puerto Penasco, and I'm and it's in like in a baseball diamond, mm -hmm. like like a like a little league baseball diamond, and it's cement bleachers. Not even the best part of Rocky Point, mm -hmm. you know. It's not <laughs> it's not on the beach or anything, and I'm walking. I'm like pacing, going. What am I doing with my life? Are you, are you kidding me right now? You can, you know, you need to be doing something. Like I was almost in a depressed mode. Am I in the circus? Yeah, that's exactly. Well, it's when you want to see federales. <laughs> yes, yeah, come get me. And so I'm like, I'm, I step in the cage and I and I fight this this poor kid. He was like a college wrestler, Embry Riddle, whatever. And and uh, and I was getting tired too. But I remember like just just Seth Bozinski was down there and he he remembers watching. He, he jokes about it too. Um, but it, it, it was another one of those where I you know, got him down, just kind of like kept punching and punching and punching. Finally, they pulled him, pulled me off, but really did no damage at that time too. So I had like three fights of not doing a whole lot of damage to anybody besides slamming him a bunch of times. Mm -hmm. I think collegiate wrestlers transitioning into MMA today, there's, a, there's quite a bit more structure. A <laughs> lot more structure. Well, they're coaching and training so much better. I mean, yeah. we were and – th and that's – I, I think about what the, what we did at Arizona Combat Sports with our with our training, and we were sparring three days a week sometimes, and not like I right, take it easy, try to figure it out, you know. Like I don't know what the hell I'm doing, and I got to mm -hmm. get it with Steve Steinbeis and Ryan Bader and CB Dollarway and some of these guys that were just we would just try to beat the shit out of each other, and I didn't know what I was doing, 
So that, that I mean, I remember going home with headaches. I remember sitting out in the parking lot, going, like taking a deep breath, going, "Gotta go spar today," and like not looking forward to it at all. And so it took a while to get comfortable with it. And then once we had our gym at Power, and then I was like comfortable sparring and I knew what I was doing I wasn't going to take just straight because I didn't walk straight into punches mm -hmm. I knew how to move my head mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't as bad but man originally it was just like I'm, I'm going to every like three days a week I'm fighting for my life with with guys that knew what they were doing um, and and even Bader and CB didn't know what they were doing but goddamn they could hit hard mm -hmm. <laughs> so luckily I never had to spar with Kane he was already gone by that time and I, I wouldn't have anyway I'd, I would I had to wrestle Kane and that was horrible you know when we were when he was in college or whatever but yeah, it was a uh, it was a, it was a good time, mm -hmm. especially with those with those three. I mean, CB and I CB was probably the toughest for me to wrestle out of the three. Bader was really just kind of uh, he didn't shoot much. He'd front head lock and pull you down. CB was just wild, and scrambly, and was like exhausting. And Kane would just try to beat the crap out of you. And I could hand fight with Kane pretty good, except right towards the end of his senior year, he beat the crap out of me. Like when he was get primed for the NCAA tournament, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Then I was like, ah, I'm not wrestling with Kane anymore. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was a fight. What a, pretty what a cool. crew! No uh, kidding. And yeah. if you think about like, it's not just just those or us four. And then you have like Bubba Jenkins came through as a transfer from Penn State. Mm -hmm. um, John Moraga was on that team, and John mm -hmm. made the OC and fought for a title. He was on that same team with with all of us, and really doesn't get lumped in because. But he came over to Arizona Combat Sports a little bit. He just got li his, his his career just got started a little bit later. Um, but we had, like, I mean, Dan Henderson, some of the guys before that were really really put ASU on the map and yeah. just kind of continued yeah. it. Oklahoma State, obviously their wrestling program's done well in the in the UFC. They've had some titles with Johnny Hendricks and in DC, but um ours had just kind of it's it's a, it's for some reason it's set aside and everybody else, maybe because mm -hmm. we were the originators mm -hmm. in a way. Yeah. yeah, it's not like there was just U four in this wide gap. Like for someone like myself who became a fan of collegiate wrestling after I became a fan of MMA when you look at the Which list, is cool to hear because yeah. I think that was that's was the goal in a yeah. way. And I played I played basketball in high school and college and lacrosse in college. I I never watched any wrestling. And if you would have told me back then that I'd be going to local high school wrestling matches <laughs> and watching collegiate wrestling tournaments, I, twenty years ago I, I wouldn't believe it. Yeah. But it's amazing what wrestling did for MMA and MMA did for wrestling too. Yeah. yeah. But when you look at ASU's list. I think any casual MMA fan looks at AS, ASU's list of wrestlers and you recognize two-thirds of the names there. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty wild. It seems, it seems to me like ASU's wrestling program reminds me of Notre Dame's football program. It, it's kind of separate from everybody else in the conference. There's something they do differently there. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the athletes are known to have a lot of integrity. Like these names that we're talking about today, like when, you know, a lot of you guys are local here from Phoenix. And so we have a lot of mutual friends. Maybe we all went to high school together or something like that. And you always hear the same thing. Like, oh, Aaron or, um, you know, other, other people like, wow, they're so personal. They're so nice. When I met this professional UFC fighter, I didn't expect who I met. You know, what, what do they do different at that program at ASU? What's, what's different about ASU wrestling program versus other programs in the conference? I, I, I don't know how to answer that except that I think the sport of wrestling, you become you – be you understand um, being uh, humble. You mm -hmm. know, I think you get humbled a lot, and you understand that you're not. You know, you, you, even if you you are at the top at one point, and there are some cocky wrestlers out there, and and, and there are some guys like like a Chael Sonnen who, if you spoke to him, he would <laughs> he is the nicest guy in the world. Mm -hmm. He would be right here talking to us and didn't care who you were or what you know. Didn't feel like he was better for you. It's all an act for Chael when he gets on stuff like yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. But um, because he was, he he understands humility and and. And really, what it takes to get there, and he understands, right? Loves wrestling. He follows it. Obviously, he was an All American at, at Oregon. Um, he and I had a had a match back in the day too. But um, God, I've wrestled everybody: Ben Askren, mm -hmm. all of, all those dudes, um, King Mo. I had some, mm -hmm. I had some good ones. I don't, that's I'm, that's off the subject. But I, I think ASU wrestlers. We we were a pretty special group. Um, my that group that I came out with. But it, it's really the sport. Um, obviously, ASU has set itself apart just in general because within the conference and the stuff we've done nationally, guys like Anthony Robles have come through there, mm -hmm. and, or like you know, obviously an international story with Anthony Amazing Robles. Um, we've had some really cool things, you know, some some things happen. But, but this is a program that was dropped mm -hmm. in 2008. They dropped ASU was dropped because of Title IX for two weeks. Um, Lisa Love, the athletic director, who ended up getting fired after this, um, she she put it on the chopping block, and cut it. 
and didn't talk to anybody. Sure. And so the, the alumni, a lot of people got together and brought it back and not, that doesn't happen. Programs don't get saved. Once they get mm -hmm. cut, you don't see them come back. Boise State's been cut, Oregon, University of Oregon, Nike U has been, dropped their program and never brought it back. So for mm -hmm. ASU to bring, come back, is is that might that might speak right there as to what mm -hmm. you know how important that program was yeah, people know yeah mm -hmm. title IX was a challenge for wrestling you know, when, it, when it first happened um for obvious reasons and now you see awesome girls and women's programs in schools yes so it, it's getting bigger and bigger yeah. high school there's high arizona we have a high girls high school state championship so mm -hmm. yeah title nine was meant to provide more opportunities for women, mm -hmm. not cut from men's, and that's where they got it wrong in the in the in the nineties, um, in the early two thousands. Is they're like, God, oh, we can't we can't balance it. There's too many men's programs. We got to instead of fundraising and getting more women's, they mm -hmm. cut, they cut, mm -hmm. cut, cut to bring it down to women. It wasn't fair, mm -hmm. you know. And they were counting football against it all, and footballs, especially scholarship wise and and team wise. You know, they got 60, 70, 80 guys on a team. And you know, an exorbitant amount of scholarships. You can't compare with that mm -hmm. any sport. So yeah, Title IX really, really, really hurt wrestling and men's sports for a little while. For a little while, um, and now like you get an AD at ASU, and they're starting programs like, left and right. They got women's programs, beach volleyball, triathlon, which we've been like national champs the last several years. So it's really cool that that they that the true meaning of Title IX is now taking mm -hmm. taking its way, making its way, I guess. Mm -hmm. So more the sport itself than ASU's program, yes. the individual. Kind of like Gable says, like once you wrestle, everything else seems fairly easy. Yeah. You know, something like yeah, that. Yeah, that, that's, yeah, yeah, there's nothing else that, that compares in my opinion. So on the podcast, we, we always get into sports medicine and sports injury. Now, uh, most peer-reviewed journals agree that in collegiate wrestling, the injuries that wrestlers tend to suffer for, from the most are, well, head injuries and concussions, right? Which a lot of people, when you think concussion, you immediately go to football mm -hmm. and hockey, but wrestling as well. Shoulder. Not true. <laughs> shoulder <laughs> dislocations. Fake, fake news. <laughs> <laughs> shoulder dislocations, elbow injuries, knee, and ankle. Do you think, and, and also skin disorders, of course, right, with wrestling. Um, do you think that, well, in the nine years that you were coaching at ASU, did that is that consistent with what you saw? Like, what were your typical injuries you saw over the course of those nine years that just kind of like pl would plague the team? If if we reorganize your list there, I would put head injuries at the en at the end. Mm -hmm. I didn't see too many of those. I, that, that and I remember we had one kid in particular that that had because they didn't really have a baseline test either though. Mm -hmm. they, so they finally had the baseline test, and then he was concussed, and then they mm -hmm. he, they wouldn't allow him back on until he met that the requirements. But I didn't see a whole lot of those, so that wasn't. You know, your head, there's some head contact and it happens, but I don't know, either wrestlers are too stubborn or not, but mm -hmm. it's not like those he, those football collisions where those dudes right. are, you know, cracking their heads pretty good. Um, I'd say one of the, the biggest, and, and I suffer from it now, is neck injuries. Mm -hmm. um, just that constant, you know, the tugging on someone's head. That's why you see wrestling with the big necks, but they mm -hmm. can also, like I have, like really, Mm -hmm. like hardly any range you know, like look left and right mm -hmm. um so i think a neck injury and i don't know if you mentioned that but that that is yeah that's not like in the top five or six that usually get reported but it, and you got to figure there's acute injuries but there's chronic too like when we see lifelong wrestlers or wrestlers that went into jujitsu or mma mm -hmm. with bad necks later there's a lot of them and you s it's usually a degenerative issue that's what it in is the lower yeah. neck disc issues disc degeneration and when you think about the force that you're putting on the neck in wrestling it's just when you shoot in and get stuffed, mm -hmm. that, that compressive force on your forehead or the top of your head translates right down to your to the lower part of your neck and the wear and tear. Ba basically, wrestlers wear and tear their neck faster than other athletes, but it doesn't show up until yeah, later. a decade and a half Especially later. Especially if you stay with it. Mm -hmm. Marcus Mollica, two-time national champ for us, has a nasty scar running down his neck from his. Eric Larkin had, had a... Uh, had a neck surgery where they went in through the front and mm -hmm. they, they put like a uh, discectomy or a laminectomy or yeah. disc replacement. Yeah, disc yeah. replacement. So I mean, I know some several people like that. I, I need it. I know I need a need a surgery here before too long. I'm mm -hmm. My neck cracks all the time, and it's mm -hmm. in, I mean, you've you've adjusted me. Um, so I, I kind of I kind of made a list here of things that, that hit. My first was my knees mm -hmm. in college. Um, I think I had a football injury that that's in high school that happened, and then it just slowly but surely. So I had two knee surgeries, a meniscus chopped out didn't repair um but that that oh, that hit our wrestlers more than anything guys in on mm -hmm. single legs kicking out spinning yeah. whatever and you get the pops yeah knees number one on the list okay yeah. and then um ankles 
because there's not a lot of jumping or anything, so ankles mm-hmm. or whatever, but low back. So it was knee for me, neck was, I remember neck since, or, 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 or tightening up a lot, like mm-hmm. season up, and then I couldn't wrestle for a week. Um, low back ended up later in my career, like when I was wrestling freestyle and stuff, I remember having issues, but I felt like that happened from weightlifting. I feel like when I was squatting, mm-hmm. I, I, I did some stuff there. Um, then my elbows when I started fighting, which I remember wrestling CB when, when, and he grabbed my wrist and he shoved my, my arm at me and, and it was still wrestling. And I remember my elbow is flaring up. And then fast forward to MMA and I remember like me catching it, could have been CB again. I remember like, like catching a punch, like blocking and catching the same thing where my, 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 my wrist got pushed to my shoulder, my elbow flared up. And then I got a hyperextended in an arm bar one time. Mm. Um, the talus light his arm bar me and didn't let go. Bit of a dick at that time, I felt. <laughs> um, I didn't know what I was doing. He freaking arm barred me. I didn't think he yeah. tried to hurt me. It was well, training. One so, of the, and then sorry. shoulders. So yeah. that was my, my order. Then my shoulder, and I remember thinking, like, shoulders, God, I'm so lucky I don't have bad shoulders. I remember mm-hmm. thinking that all along, and now, you know, here I am, 45 years old. My shoulders may be the worst pain I have of mm-hmm. everything. Mm-hmm. And you just hurt your shoulder recently, too. And I, and I yeah, before we're going to get into that. But sure. yeah, And that was not from wrestling or anything. It was for me being an eight, riding. I was on a road bike 16 miles into a ride, and I'm clipped in with my shoes. I'm feeling pretty good. And I go over a curb to make a light because there's no traffic. So I'm going to cross on the street. And then I landed right on my left shoulder and separated grade two separation. Mm-hmm. Of my neck. I remember texting you right yeah. after. And AC joint, grade AC. two separation. Oh, God. And it was, I thought I broke my shoulder. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm about four weeks out of that. Um, that was back in April. No, May. That was in May. And, uh, God, we're June already right now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's crazy. But, uh, yeah, so, I, you know, that's obviously I'm seeing you for the rehab now mm-hmm. and trying to get that worked on. Gotcha. Yeah, and what we're doing, like, if we could just go on AC joint separations for a little bit. Um, so AC joint separations often get confused with shoulder dis- dislocations, you know? And that's what I thought it was. Yeah. I'm, I'm like, oh, shit. And when you I hear it or dislocated. Yeah, when you hear shoulder dislocation, your mind just goes into awful places, yeah. right? But, um and if I had to pick one, I'd take an AC joint, right? Because I think well, m- most people who wrestle or do jujitsu have strained or sprained their AC joint at least, you know? Because right. the mechani- mechanism of injury, when you think of an AC joint separation, the best way to explain it is picture a hockey player getting checked into the boards, right? They get checked into the boards and they sort of absorb the shock with their shoulder. Now, if they get checked with too much force or unexpected sh- force, you sprain that joint or... Um, separate that joint and basically you stair step that that AC joint now in MMA or wrestling same deal but instead of checked into the boards it's slammed to the ground mm-hmm. right with more force or road biking yeah or or, <laughs> or, 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 yes. or pedals that don't full contact yeah. <laughs> so um, there's three grades right there's three grades to an AC joint separation grade one you strain and sprain the joint right so there's not a lot if any stair stepping you know when you if you if you just look at an image of an AC joint separation you see like the stair stepping you know effect that happens there and that's just means you you basically sprained it like a sprained ankle and it's going to get better you might have a little bump there and you might not but it'll improve grade two like you did a few months ago is you've actually deranged the ligament a little bit maybe tore it a little and there's visible stepping right For sure and that's what and that's what when it hung mm-hmm. you know and I'm, and I'm feeling like i broke my shoulder or dislocated because i yeah. don't know i've never had it yeah. before you're and feeling I, a bump that wasn't there and before. everyone's like you need to go and and uh God, what was the show where, where Mel Gibson slammed his shoulder? Yeah, lethal weapon. Lethal That's how I was thinking. You gotta that, go like, lethal weapon. It. Just go in there. The doctor's gonna lethal weapon you, <laughs> and you're gonna you're gonna be you're gonna be fine. I'm like, yeah. What was that? Was Mel Gibson? Is that possible to pop your shoulder out like that? I think that was like a dislocation. Yeah, yeah he's right. Yeah, right. he's right. in a straight yeah, jacket. But that's what I thought. I thought out. I dislocated. For AC joint separation, that would be <laughs> like that would be like doing it again. You know what yeah. Yeah. He dislocated, yeah. got out of yeah. the straight jacket, and he slammed his shoulder, and <laughs> it's like. Uh, so. so anyway, that's that's yeah. what I thought. Of and <laughs> grade grade three, grade three, you've torn the ligament, the AC ligament, or the coracoclavicular ligament underneath it, and that thing's not stable, and you you probably need surgery, right? Well, and and so is there a grade four, five, and six? No, it's one, two, and three. Okay. But three, three means it's blown out. And, and you're getting surgery. At that more point. than likely. Yeah, okay. I mean, somebody doesn't have to get surgery. It depends on how much you plan on using that shoulder forever. So right? what happened was when I sent you that text, I think I sent you the picture or I told you, and you said mm-hmm. it's probably a grade two, and which means that's pro- it's probably your best case if you go grade three or more. Mm-hmm. And I was like, 
like you that allowed me to sleep that night mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. thank you yeah because i was like god damn it i don't want to get surgery and then i didn't have the doctor appointment until the next day with the x-ray yeah. or whatever yeah so. and one of the one of the biggest things with an ac joint uh separation is immediate physical medicine because here you have the sprung joint right either sprung joint or a torn ligament and that that bone's is not lining up or sprung uh sprain but I guess in the post, po you get past sprung? tense, sprung. it would be sprung. It's like getting a cramp. Go on, Doc. That's <laughs> but awesome. You, uh, you have that joint that's not lining up right. And, you know, when you, when you stand there and look in the mirror and you see this bone sticking out, it, usually you get into what they call Brueger's position or Brueger's posture like this, like an anatomy picture, and you'll see that it line up and the bump goes away. But then if you get into the regular resting posture like most people have with rounded shoulders, it comes back. So the biggest concern with a grade one or a grade two is, what position is that shoulder going to be in because it's going to heal? Do we want it to heal in a bad position or a good position? And that's probably the most mismanaged we, thing we see with AC joint separations is weeks go by before the person starts any physical medicine, physical therapy, stuff like that. Um, and what, basically what you want to do is you want to put it in a good position so it heals well. And that's what we're doing with you right from the jump is antalgic positions, positions you should try to f get yourself in most of the day, and sleeping, sleeping with the arm supported, finding a way to sleep up if you face up if you don't usually, and just making sure you're not spending your day with rounded shoulders, right? So, which is kind of hard to do, but there's a few things you can do to do it. And then adding in the right exercises really quickly as soon as you can that help stabilize the scapula, bring your shoulders back, basically you work on your posture. When you have a sprung AC Books joint. on your head, right? Yeah, no, you could. <laughs> Um, That's basically different. when you have a, when you have an injured AC joint, you want to do a lot of posture rehab and keep those shoulders back and heal in a good position and not in a bad position. He, here's a good example. My dad is nearly 70 and when he was about 65, he fell out of a boat, separated his shoulder. What was he doing? How did he fall out of this boat? I, I, <laughs> people tend to fall out of boats on weekends, right? Okay. It was a weekend, so, uh, it was a weekend uh, trip uh, and so your 65 year old dad just fell out yeah, of the boat. Okay. He, <laughs> I think just he was, lay the story he was out. driving aggressively mm. and took a turn and, you know, so as you, you fell out of the boat yeah. while, while yeah. driving. <laughs> well, That's he, a better there, there story. No seat belt. Yeah. He's a water, he's a, he's an avid water skier and he loves to water ski boats. You can spin them around like a jet ski and he takes people on rides and he's been doing that move for 40 years with people. Now he's a little older, a little bit lighter yeah. and he did that move and it just ejected him. Right? May or may <laughs> not have been geez. inebriated. And right. right. <laughs> so goes to the, goes to the emergency room, right? They take an x-ray, send them home, say orthopedic group will call you next week. Uh, Monday gets a call from, from an orthopedic office. And they're like, you know, you should come in right away, right? He goes in right away. Big orthopedic group, youngest doctor in the group sees him and says, you've got a grade three. They all they have is an x-ray. Grade three, it's blown out. You're going to need surgery or that shoulder's going to eventually fall apart. And older guys like you tend to get this problem with their clavicle. So we're going to shave that down while we do it. Let's do surgery Thursday, right? He calls me from Boston and tells me this. Like, hold it, get an MRI, and uh, let's see what's going on. And then go to one of your friends, right, who's a, who's a doctor. And uh, he gets, gets the MRI done. He's only got a grade two. By the time he gets a second opinion and things, you know, it could, just like your shoulder, could have been rehabbed with postural exercise, taping the shoulder back, a bunch of different things. But the three weeks that got wasted in the orthopedic group trying to roll him into surgery and um, not knowing what he should do and then getting an MRI and figuring it out when, he, when the, the time that was wasted healed the shoulder in a bad position. Mm. And that's one thing we see with AC joint separations a lot is um, prolonged consultations and consults and what do we do when physical, this is one of those injuries where f good physical medicine right away, even if you had a grade three and ended up getting surgery, it's not gonna hurt you to, to treat it physically right. pronto. Um, AC joints, you want to get right on them because they're they're no matter what they're healing from the moment you hurt it, mm -hmm. and you really want to watch. You the said position. it. You said it healed in a wrong way. What happens then? Well, so he's got Do a very vi that? visible. Then you're properly fucked. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like what? And it's amazing. <laughs> AC joints. You know, basically that's where your shoulder attaches to your body. Right. Your whole shoulder complex really just sits on your thorax, and the only real attachment point is where the clavicle attaches to the sternum. But, you know, the clavicle is part of the shoulder. Right. And that attaches to, um, you know, the, a the AC joint. So that's where your shoulder attaches. I like to think of it like the strut of a shoulder. But it's amazing. You can blow that thing out and have it misaligned. I know big weightlifters that um, yeah, have a misaligned big. shoulder or they had surgery because their, their AC joint was, had osteoarthritis where they just resection the shoulder. They cut, cut the end off and re re 
you know, reattach it. Mm -hmm. And now you've got a different size clavicle. Things aren't really lined up very well, but the shoulder works great. They can do shoulder wow. presses and everything. So bad AC joints still work pretty well, but you've got this visible bump. Like in my dad's case, he's got this huge bump there. You know, he wears a yeah. t-shirt. It looks like someone put a walnut in his The shirt. ladies um, dig it though. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so altogether, AC joint, you want to start treating that thing right away, you know? Hmm. Well, and that was, I, I think with mine, it was, there was just so much pain involved. So I think I finally got in the pool like after a couple of days and I was able to just be the, mm -hmm. having the pool and taking gravity off or whatever. I was mm -hmm. able to lift my arm up a little bit more, but it took a little bit of a while. I, mean, I think I was two weeks before I came in to see you and I was trying to do like posture stuff just yeah. on my own. Yeah. Um, pain, yeah. pain wise. And obviously you can't sit there with your shoulder back, you know, in the exaggerated posture all yeah. day, but you do, you, you try to do the best you can. Unless you're yeah. yelling at people saying, come at me, bro. Yeah, yeah right. bring it. What's that too? Now, you had a, a really crazy situation happen with your elbow when you were supposed to fight Daniel Branch. Yeah. And you talked about hurting your elbow a few times previously, and you thought you had an elbow thing going on. But if you could tell us a little bit about that. Well, I, really, the story is, and we, were, we, were, we had left Arizona Combat Sports because we were opening up Power MMA. So we went up to a gym called The Lion's Den at the time, if anyone remembers that from the old days. There's a great documentary on uh, Fight Pass. Uh -huh. And it's called the Lions, it's something like the Lions Den, the world's first MMA team. Uh -huh. And it's just, it's a good like forty minute snippet about the Lions Den, and it's it's a riot. And it's well, awesome. that and that's the California Lions Den. I think this was like they just got the name and they opened it out, out uh, here, but like Shamrock wasn't yep. there or anything. Um, Ken Shamrock and those guys. But um, anyway, so we train, we were training up there for the time being. Um, the owner allowed us to come in there knowing that we were opening up the gym power or whatever. So we're sparring, and I don't know how clean the place was. So I'm, I'm, I don't know what happens, but that I, I go home from a, a night of sparring, and and my nose, I don't know if I get hit in the nose. I thought I broke my nose, whatever. I wake up in the middle of the night, my no, my lip is swollen, my nose is swollen. I'm like, God damn, I broke my nose. It's finally swollen up on me. I didn't know. Mm -hmm. So I remember calling the next day, calling Eric Larkin, and going, Dude, I think I broke my nose. And he goes, Do you look like uh, the Who's from? from Whoville or whatever, you know, <laughs> I'm like, it's exactly what it looked like. He goes, your nose, it's infected. Mm -hmm. You have an infection, you go see the doctor. Um, so somehow something opened up a scab or something and an infection got through my nose. So like, I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, th 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 like I had a broken nose and I swung it. So I can't like, it's all kind of a blur in a, in a way, but I, I don't know if I saw the doctor, but I remember getting really sick, like, like, thinking, oh, now I got the flu. I got a broken, that's what it was. I had a broken nose and I have the flu. And I didn't call Eric until the next day after this, whatever. So I hadn't seen a doctor. And um, I remember like going out in my backyard and it was, I think it was still kind of, I don't know if it was cold or what, but I was burning up and I have the flu and a broken nose in my mind and I'm wanting to die. Like I, mm -hmm. I didn't go to the hospital cause I'm, you know, knucklehead, I guess. But, um, I see the doctor the next day, and then they're like, "Oh yeah, you have it, it's a it's a, a uh, I got an infection here. We get here to take these pills." Mm -hmm. Well, along the time, my elbow started. Maybe a, a, a next day, so now maybe three days in, my elbow starts hurting, and I'm and I'm like, "God damn it!" Now I have a hurt elbow, a broken nose, a <laughs> flu, or whatever. Like everything's going. Of course, I have an infection. Long story short, like five days later, I, I go see my I go see Dr. McCoy, who is an ASU sports doc. Um, Roger, Roger McCoy, McCoy. Yep. and he's he's helped me all along. He helped me with this shoulder he's injury. He's fantastic. He's 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 the best. I got him on speed dial, and he responds to me. He was with, actually he he was a, for a long time he was uh, the Arizona Diamondbacks yep. team physician since their inception. Yeah, since they made the D backs. I mean, he was on the, the World Series team, mm -hmm. right? and, and he was an ASU guy. So he and I are friends. So I'm able to shoot him stuff all the time, pictures of my AC. Um, so I go see him and he goes, you need to go to the hospital right now. I'm going to set you up with Dr. Shabra, get up there. Um, you have an infection in your elbow. Got to get your test. Jesus. So, yeah. So of course, so it was septic. It, 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 Systemic too. It, it went all the way through my body and it pooled in my weak, in my, in my, it found like the weakest spot in my body. So it was in my blood. So I go up there and, and they get to the emergency room. They, they, all along, like I'm, I'm thinking, you know, I don't, I don't really realize how, how you know, important or how dangerous it really is. So they go in, they're like, we got to cut you open, we got to get that cleaned out. So they go, they do it all. My wife's freaking out because she thinks she, the, the doctor's talking to her. I could have lost my arm or I could have died. 
Right. I've come up out of surgery. They cleaned everything out. Um, they cut me open there, cleaned it all out. It was it was staph infection. It was MRSA or whatever. But I had so many antibiotics, and there's different antibiotics for different infections, um, that they couldn't really find out at that point what type of infection it was, but it was bad. Um, so they, they ended up ho- hitting a pick line into my heart. So I went home with the pick line, then I had to give myself an own, my own IV That's for several fuck. weeks. <laughs> oh, it was just insane. So I had to pull out of the UFC, f- uh, pull out with David Branch. And I'm like laying in bed, sick, put a pick line in. Like it's my early. life took that. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's, 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 so it could have been much worse. So wash your hands before you pick your nose. Wash your hands before you pick your nose. <laughs> um, that, so, I'm, and I'm, I have two kids now and I've got to fight. Like that, mm-hmm. this, is, this is our livelihood. My wife is working a little bit, but it's not enough. And I don't have insurance. The UFC wasn't picking up insurance at the mm-hmm. time. So I don't even know if I had insurance at the time. If I did, it was, it was horrible insurance not for something like this. So I, I ended up costing us a lot of money. Um, so I got to take a fight. So as soon as I can rehab, I take a fight with Mark Munoz. And, and, and now we don't have a gym because power hadn't opened yet. I'm not going to go, go up to Lions Den anymore or whatever. So I'm going to, and I'm maybe, I don't know, maybe six weeks out of surgery. And I'm, now I've got uh, maybe a six to eight week training camp to get ready for a fight. So now I'm flying out to AKA, my manager Dave Martin's flying me out to AKA to train with Josh Koscheck, who's a buddy of mine, who was fighting GSP. Um, Cormier had just started going there, Daniel Cormier, and some of the other AKA guys. So I'm going back and forth. I'm wrestling at ASU, doing my training at ASU in the wrestling room when I'm home, and then going out to AKA to, to train for Munoz's fight. And it was just like hectic. And then yeah. I go and I fight Mark Munoz, and it was for like $15,000, you know, 15 to show, 15 to win. Um, which is really horrible money if mm-hmm. you think about it. But you know, what, after what I've gone through or whatever, mm-hmm. and I go out and I have a split, uh, lose a split decision with with Mark, and and all along, like Mark and I, were, were good friends. Or in fact, we both got into MMA at the same time. He was coaching at UC Davis. We were training together, and he's like, I'm thinking about you know starting a fight. And I'm like, yeah, I kind of think I might do it too <laughs> a little bit. Like we're just kind of joking around. We worked out at the NCAA tournament as coaches in Michigan at the. Uh, in Detroit, not Detroit, but uh, in in where the where they where the basketball used to play, the Palace at Auburn Hills. Mm-hmm. So yeah, we were at the yeah. NCAA wrestling tournament coaching. I was at ASC. Or, no, I was at Cal Poly at the time, and he was at Davis. And we're training. We decided to grapple a little bit in between sessions, and then like the next, you know, two years later, we're fighting each other in the Palace at Auburn Hills. That's awesome. It creates this type weird how it all happened. <laughs> and we were friends. Like we were yeah, good friends. Yeah. And I remember getting a call like, hey, they want you to fight Mark, Mu- Mark Munoz. And so we text each other, hey, man, we're going to fight each other. Yeah, okay, just going to do it. And it was like really, and he's got a family. I've got, I remember thinking like weird things like, God, am I going to be able to elbow him in his face? Am I really going to be able to punch him? And if you watch the fight, there were probably some times where we both hold back a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know why, just like, and it was a great fight. I mean, we went we went to war a little yeah. bit. Um, you probably felt like you were going to gravitate toward grappling regardless. Well, yeah. I took him down five times. He took me down two, but he kind of outstruck me in, in times. Mm-hmm. Um, landed some leg kicks. It was just a whole weird thing. So he felt fine about punching you. Yeah, he <laughs> felt fine. So <laughs> he's a fucking man. asshole. <laughs> yeah. He's super religious, too, so God was on his side. Yeah. One, <laughs> one really interesting thing about that story is, like, I mean, thank God Eric, when you called him, knew your symptomatology and was like yeah no you don't have a broken nose instead of just saying oh neat story yeah, yeah. because one thing wrestlers and mma people and people just doing jujitsu or whatever need to consider is that w- one thing that's different is lots of times you come home hurt and you don't even know how you got hurt mm-hmm. you know a few months ago i came home from jujitsu with a broken finger it's not till four or five hours later i'm like oh my pinky's definitely it's broken my issue. wife's like how did you break your finger i'm like i don't know yeah. she, how do you not know how you broke your finger i'm like it just Hours later, it started hurting, and it's crooked, you know? And one thing about, you know, we were talking about skin uh, skin problems with wrestlers and the communicable dise- diseases. When you combine that and the weird symptomatology, like your elbow hurting, along with a history of a hurt elbow, and the thing that fighters in general face that everyone else doesn't is getting injured without knowing what happened, that's a dangerous combination. Oh, right? yeah. yeah. So so wrestlers and fighters really need to be proactive. When when you have an injury that doesn't make sense, you have to think systemically. Well, you have to the, think. That's scary, man. The looks for that weak point, like you're saying it landed in your elbow. Like yeah. Maybe. That's maybe. Nuts. Yeah. Isn't it? You know, I thought I just hyper my elbow in practice yeah. or something. And then mm-hmm. it, like, all made sense. But it's funny that you say that about, like, a- after coaching I- I- in college for 10 years and being around, you know, MMA, like, I... 
I feel like I've earned a doctorate in a way and, and, mm-hmm. and at least understanding what an injury, you know, like Eric, like calling Eric Lark mm-hmm. and, and saying that and he goes, oh, dude, you're, it's infected. Mm-hmm. I had that. And like, we know these things we've all gone through. Like it's I've on gone the job through, training. Yeah, it's on the yeah. job training. <laughs> Literally. You, you know? know, and so it's kind of, it, that's a, that's a cool thing about the sport is like, we've had everything. We've seen yeah. skin. I like, I don't know how many times I have people go, hey, they send me a picture. What do you think this is? I'm like, oh, you got herpes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they're not sending me dick pics or anything. <laughs> <but>. <laughs> you, know, you know what, Matt herpes, it's a, a, a herpes, uh, Herpes simplex type one, one yeah. is uh, it, the technical name for it is actually herpes gladiatorium, like gladiators. And, and, and they, oh, you know, wow. they named that a long time ago because it was known know even that. way back uh, uh, that wrestlers, you, from wrestling other people, you pass this from one thing or another. Yeah. I had a really good I- intern at the clinic this year who's in chiropractic school, and he was a Division one wrestler. And he threw this statistic at me. I was looking for it this morning. I couldn't, I couldn't find it, so, so don't, don't hang me on the statistic. But it was something like 80-something percent of Division One college wrestlers have herpes gladiatorium. Yeah, I would. Yeah. I I wouldn't. I mean, I everyone. If I get stressed out or don't sleep, it pops up on my forehead. Yep. I have like three spots on yep. my ear or under my nose. Forehead, cheek, and shoulder, back of the shoulder. Yeah. Really? Yep. I, wow. Yeah. I've never had it below below my chin, I guess. Yeah. But. Um, so how should we shake your hand, knuckle bumps, elbows? No, we don't shake hands anymore. <laughs> Just point. Like, don't yeah. you know that where we're living these days? <laughs> yeah. We're yeah. shaking hands. You know, it's wh- the new normal. One yeah. thing you were talking about, like the on the on the do- job training, that sort of being a wrestling medic. One cool thing that I, that I learned a couple years ago, and I've been waiting for it to come up on the podcast because I, I I love this topic. Is um, most people can trace MMA and wrestling um, and, and this sport back to ancient Japan and judo, right? Mm-hmm. Everybody in jiu-jitsu and everybody, everybody loves ancient Japan and judo. Yeah, oh yeah. Um, and we know judo was created by Higuro Kano, right? Um, what a missing piece of the story that people don't realize is, especially back then in the ancient uh, judo academies in Japan, uh, most of the black belt teachers directly from Higuro Kano were uh, bone setters. They were ancient chiropractors, right? Oh, wow. And they called mm-hmm. them the Seifukuchi or the Hansuki. And every judo aca- academy had at least one student, sometimes more, whose job it was to help the other students with their injuries, their day-to-day injuries and dislocated shoulders and things like that, but also to teach them how to treat themselves, rib strains, uh, ankles, stuff like that. Yeah. And it was actually part of the judo curriculum. Going through the, the curriculum as a student was not just learning judo, but part of judo was actually maintenance of your own body. And uh, Higuro Kano, the, the developer of judo, actually, most people know that jujitsu came from judo, judo came from ancient jujutsu, and jujutsu was taught mostly by these bone setters. Huh. And Higuro Kano wanted to take jujutsu. He was too small. This is sort of the legend and lore that goes around, around the story. Um, he wanted to take judo. He was too small. None of the academies would k- take him. So he would walk around in Tokyo and look for the signs on the businesses of these guys, the bone setters. And he would ask them to teach him a little, a little jujutsu. Here and there, he learned some. And eventually, he found a teacher who was also a bone setter that took him into, into his uh, academy. And actually, Higuro's first judo lessons were in the waiting room of this bone setters clinic. He would treat patients throughout the day. And then they put mats in the waiting room, and he would do his jujutsu classes there. No way. Yeah, so it's kind of interesting that not yeah. only is the development of judo and jujitsu very closely related to people who were taking care of the students, but it was actually part of the curriculum. Uh, there's a really good show on Fight Pass. Uh, it's Minotaro show. I forget what it was called, um, but he where he travels around the world and he goes to like he goes to Rio and does some jujitsu. He goes to Thailand does some Muay Thai and in the episode where he goes to Japan he goes to one of the big universities in Tokyo follows their uh, judo team around for a few days and the head coach actually takes him upstairs where they have a clinic and they're doing things like acupuncture and and then the types of bone setting type treatments that the judo academies did even way back then so even today it's part of the curriculum of actual judo and now you fast forward come to the other side of the planet wrestling MMA still exist today you guys are teaching each other how to fix these things because you can't you can't go to urgent care every day yeah <laughs> uh, you and the university cannot afford it well my my, my coach at ADSU when I was there was Leroy Smith who is John Smith's older brother John was his Oklahoma State wrestling coach and two-time Olympic champ and one of the greatest uh, USA's ever mm-hmm. put out and Leroy thought he was a doctor 
Right. And he would, we would say something, and he wasn't at all. He was right. no, not even close. <laughs> and he'd be like, you know, you'd get hurt, and he'd be like, you're okay. Yeah. Get up. Yeah. Sometimes a broken ankle's better than a sprained ankle. And yeah. He just say these Shit. things, and it was hilarious. So. And everybody knows it's important not to get out of your scope, right? And that, and that's, I think, Stay maybe that lane. needs to be said. But yeah, the, like the biggest. We all like don't come to me because I'm really not a doctor, yeah. even though I say that's you yeah. know ringworm and it could kill you. You just <laughs> leave a stethoscope around the gym. And yeah. Then you put it on temporarily. I guess my, my point is, see, see an actual professional. Don't rely right, on right. me to. Uh, biggest thing for coaches and trainers and stuff like that is just and and the athletes themselves is being to recognize normal from abnormal right yeah. just like you with your ac joint you see yeah. you see a bump that wasn't there before that's different than if you just fell and your shoulder was swollen you well know? yeah and i and i there's also and, and, and as wrestlers we tend to not go and, and get the medical attention that we need mm-hmm. to do i mean that was just kind of a thing where it was, and I and I was always friends with our with our with our sports med guys and our mm-hmm. trainers and everything at ASU, and they would always say track was the worst. Those mm-hmm. the track the track guys would go in for any little teeny injury, uh. my hamstrings, are, and they're they're like so hypersensitive. <laughs> so like oh my hamstrings, are, and they're they 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 want all this work. Whereas like mm-hmm. we like our coach Leroy didn't want us going into the training room. You're okay, just where you can put some ice on mm-hmm. it and you'll be all right. Pain you know? is weakness leaving the body. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, so I think there's a there's a give and take on yeah. that too. Like some things you got to push through. Some things mm-hmm. you're, you're literally screwed up, and you got to go in there and get mm-hmm. it fixed. Other things you can kind of. So there's a mm-hmm. little give and take. We were saying before a dangerous combination is the skin and the communicable diseases combined with not knowing how you got hurt, and that's the third thing is the the wrestler's mentality and just toughing it toughing out. Yeah, you put those yeah. things together. I think that's nowadays dangerous. people are. You die. Yeah, I, I think nowadays that that's more. It, it's addressed better and quicker. Oh, for sure, and, I, and, it, and we can all be doctors now with Google. Right, and, ev- right. and everyone's scared of MRSA. Yeah, and if yeah. you just going back, well, everyone's bit. scared of COVID nineteen. Well, the super uh, the super bug <laughs> that goes up against the anti- you know, antibiotics where they stop working. Mm-hmm. That's the scary. Yeah, side. that's it too. And they the and every, doctors want to throw antibiotics at you for everything. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Not feeling good, or some antibiotics. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, now we build that's up that. Well, antibiotics. Well, antibiotics. Or <laughs> motors going, military. Back, going back to what you were saying, if you hadn't called Eric, I mean, what would you have done? Probably just tried to wait it out, right? Yeah, I that could have been super bad. Flu. Yeah, would have it. It, it would have gotten. Been bad. I mean, if it, it would have got as bad as it ended up getting. I think you know, but maybe, just, maybe quicker because I think right. I, had, I ended up getting antibiotics for the for the infection of my nose, and the doctor didn't realize it was right. because it wasn't hurting running to my elbow at the time. But, um, That's crazy, man. He didn't hit me with the right antibiotic, so I got a shot. I remember like this doc, Dr. McCoy goes, we got to get you, we got to hit you with this. So then after maybe being on some type of pill, then he hit me like five days later, hit me with a shot. It's just crazy. I had different antibiotics, but had I not, yeah, Eric not said that. and, and it made, Yeah. Who knows what would have happened. Mm-hmm. Was there, was there so ever, I owe my life to Eric Larkin, you're saying. <laughs> Possibly. Yeah. He owes his life to me. <laughs> I have some stories. He owes his life to me a couple times, too. So if you're listening here. Sounds like you're even. Yeah. Um, was there ever a point, Aaron, where you thought your career, either in wrestling or MMA, was going to be over because of an injury? No. Um, no. I never, that never entered my mind. I'm mm-hmm. um, even, I'm, shit, I'm on my deathbed in a way with this elbow, mm-hmm. and, I'm, and all I'm thinking about is, like, I can't wait to heal up. Like, mm-hmm. I never had a negative attitude, like, I'm mm-hmm. not going to come through this. I mean, I'm sitting, so I ended up getting another elbow surgery after that that, that kind of helped. I mean, I can't straighten my arms anymore, but I had bone, I had 27 pieces taken out of my right elbow. This was maybe a year later. Probably joint mice, what they call joint mice. Yeah, well, I, yeah. it was. Yeah, it was. It was <laughs> chewed mm-hmm. up in there or something. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was really why the the, the the it was so weak anyway, and probably why the infection spread to it. Um, so all, all the inj- injuries that I had, never did I think like I'm done. I, I was thinking like I'll figure it out. What I if, if if this arm doesn't work, I'm still gonna figure out how. To, and I and yet equate that to like I'm I'm amazed by by MMA fighters like Ryan Bader goes in. We go to Australia. And he beats the crap out of this dude and breaks his hand in the first round. And in any sport, if you break a bone, you're pretty much done with that. You're going to go off. They're going to cart you off. You're going to go get an mm-hmm. x-ray and get a cast. Mm-hmm. He, f- he fights for two more rounds and continues to beat the – figures it out, can't use his right hand anymore. So he's elbowing him with his right arm and doing different things and ends up beat, you know, killing the guy. They should have pulled him off. It was Anthony Perot, who had no business fighting Bader in the first place. But he had a broken hand. 
Like I, I can't like stress that enough. How mm-hmm. the UFC fight? I mean, you hear that all the time. Well, like Henry I, Cejudo and Mighty Mouse, right? In the second fight, didn't Henry fuck his foot up? Yes, like, yeah, yeah, broke his first foot. Yeah. Um, John Jones and you know t- his toe going out the other way. Henry Henry tore his shoulder that not this last fight, mm-hmm. but his shoulder. He goes, I hit it, I snapped, and my shoulder yeah. dislocated against Marlon. It was a subscap tear. Yeah, so his subscap underneath the shoulder blade, the fourth muscle in the rotator cuff. Um, yeah, he somehow tore his, tore his subs. In like subs the first cap. round. Yeah, and you can see there's video where he throws, I think he throws a punch, yeah. but right after right after an exchange, he kind of shakes his arm shakes out, his arm out yeah. and keeps going. And then yeah. a- after the fight, it's like, oh, you, you tore your subs gap. Yeah, and so he had surgery. Yeah. But so that's that's insane. That, <laughs> but you're in a fight. Like, mm-hmm. you're not going to pull out. I mean, you, that's why, like, like even Dominic Cruz, and I thought it was a great stop the uh, stoppage the other day when Henry beat Dominic. Mm-hmm. You're st- you're 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 out of it, and you're still standing up trying to fight. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that just there's no other sport, in my opinion, that that takes it to that extent. Even mm-hmm. wrestling, like you break your hand in wrestling, you're not going to continue to wrestle a match. Mm-hmm. You know, when when fighting and your weapon is your right hand, mm-hmm. you're still going to fight. Like it's insane to me. Mm-hmm. You know, the only thing that stops you is when Anderson Silva breaks his shin or whatever. Yeah, can't can't kind of go on at that yeah, point. Exactly. Just put a flesh. That would have been cool though. Would have been a, just swings his leg around. around. Yeah. He uses, starts using his legs, like, yeah. like stabbing motion <laughs> with the left leg. Um, yeah. Uh, hey, Aaron. Everybody who interviews you talks about eventually hits on the fact that you're a, you're vegan, mm-hmm. right? And they talk about it like it's the weirdest thing they've ever heard in their lives, right? What do you think the number one question is that I would get from that? Why? Ooh, oh, well, protein. How do you get enough protein? How do you get right? enough protein? Yeah. And that's what it is. Yeah, yeah. You, it, it, everyone goes to that. Yeah, and, it, and it's weird. And, and I think it's becoming more and more mainstream now. You hear mm-hmm. plant-based. People don't want to say vegan anymore because vegan means... Um, Weird super political, super yeah, militant. Yeah. Um, uh, um, Antifa. You lecture your family about why they should. Yeah, play. and I'm on the verge of that sometimes. Like yeah. I see, and I'm an animal person, so yeah. that that was the reason why I why I made the switch. And I never it never clicked in my mind growing up. Like I was, I I overly cared for it. Like my dog and everything. Like I really felt deeply. Like some friends were hunting, they'd make fun of me because I wouldn't go hunting with them, and they'd be like, "Oh, dove hunting." Huh? And they'd grab it. They would they would shoot a bird and it was flopping around. They'd grab it by its head. And Twist it and the mm-hmm. body'd fly off. I'm like, God, that's fucked up. I don't understand. Mm-hmm. How is a human being? You can you can't put yourself in this little creature's. Uh, I don't know. So that that got me. So finally, fast forward, um, I meet my wife in college, and she's she becomes she becomes vegetarian and never pushes on me or whatever. And I'm like, oh, I'm not gonna do that. You know, I'm an athlete. I gotta mm-hmm. gotta eat meat. And so it really took me till when I was in the UFC that I started researching it and I, I read a, a book called Eating Animals by Jonathan Saf, uh, Safran Hol- oh, God, I can't think of his name right now. Four. Anyway, he um, it, it, it talks about that and the cruelty and, and, and what goes on. It tells a story mm-hmm. about a, a, a convicted murder, like a, a murder in a prison and their whole deal was they worked in a, in a livestock area and they were putting cows down and he was a uh, he was in Australia, I think. And here are these felons, and he's, a, he's you know he murdered several people in there, and he's in there, and they got to put these cows down. Well, this one cow walks up, and they you know going through the holding cell, whatever, and he's got to put the bullet in its head, and it walks up and just walk, usually they fight, they don't want to get in there. Mm-hmm. This one walks up, looks right up at him, and he sees a tear run down its eye, and he goes, "I put the gun down and I was done." And he went vegan that from that point on. Here he's a prisoner, mm-hmm. one of them probably ruthless, yeah. mm-hmm. and he tells that story, and that was like that really hit home to me. Like mm-hmm. it's not a natural thing to want to kill and to want to do that. And so it was really a, uh, that other people go, go plant-based because of the health reasons and oh, I'm going to lose weight and blah, mm-hmm. blah, blah. And I get that all the time, especially I was in a film called from the ground up and it, and it, it was a, a, uh, done, done by a friend of mine, Santino Panico, who really worked his ass off and spent a lot of money, a lot of other people's money to get this film done and really got pushed back because another film came out called The Game Changers, which was right. a multi, multi, multi million dollar film that, that marketed, um, and, and I actually turned that film down when I was when I was fighting. The guy reached out to me. Um, James Wilkes reached out to me, and I said I don't want to do it. I don't know why, and I'm kind of happy I didn't because I, I I wasn't an overly fan of the film, even mm-hmm. though even though it, like a lot of people called me, hey, I'm thinking I want to go plant based. Mm-hmm. I go, why do you want to do it? Well, you know, I just want to try it. But I, I feel like you have to have a deeper 
yeah. connection to it than just because you want to try it, mm -hmm. you know, or whatever. And I tell that to people, like, well, I'm not willing to do that. I'm like, well, then you don't really want to do it. Right. You know, it's got to have meaning or you're not going to do it. You're not, mm -hmm. it's okay. You, you, you can stop eating meat, you know, on Mondays. That's cool. That's going to help a little bit. But I, I feel like in order to make changes in your life, it needs something you really needs to, you need to connect with. So your whole motivation was you care for animals. Big that, time. Your, yeah. Wow. And, and raising my, raise my wife and I raising our kids, it's, it's more about teaching them compassion and, and empathy than it is, you know, oh, we're gonna, awesome. you're, you're going to eat healthy. Right. Uh, and, if, and, and really, I know it's, it's like this whole, yay, we could do this. Mm -hmm. um, but if more people thought that way, we wouldn't have what we have mm -hmm. today with, with what's going on with, with cops <laughs> and, 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 mm -hmm. and, and our you know, not having empathy when they have someone down. People that are causing the issues that they're having, you know, that when you know the stuff that's going on and hurting other people. It's just, mm -hmm. I feel like that, and maybe even meditation or something, where we're able to really, you know, yeah. look deeper into who we are. Yeah. And, and a little more compassion would be nice. Yeah, um, I think for a lot of people that want to make that jump to go vegetarian or, or vegan, I think what stops a lot of them because a lot of people see, read these books and they see these films and stuff and they're inspired to do it but logistically they just don't know how to pull it off. Like meal planning, right? Yeah. Especially for a family, that can be a challenge. Most people get home three, four, five o'clock and it's like, all right, well, what are we gonna scramble and do for dinner? Well, it's convenience you, too. It's that too. And do, do you guys have to do a ton of meal planning to get it done? We, we don't. Um not at this point. I, there's not a whole yeah. like, like meal prepping. It's a little more prepping. automatic now. It's yeah. Initially, we, did you have to? Maybe, I, I don't know about me. Maybe it was like, all right, what do we do here? I'm, I don't want to just eat salad every day. Right. I, you know, I, that, and that, that's an easy, but like I have go-to things that I do, you know, yeah. o oatmeal in the morning and yeah. and certain things that I, and I'm kind of in, like I can do the same thing over and over and over time. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever I can, I'm not, and food, I think we have this weird thing with food in the United States and maybe worldwide. Like it's like, it's a, it's a something we, you know, we have to do and, I don't know. It's so it's such a mental thing with me. Like some people are food people. Like they have to have, you know, Doritos and mm -hmm. Cheetos and bacon like is a, so good. Yeah, it's like a sickness <laughs> though. You know, you, it's like an addiction. Yeah. You know, people are, are food addiction, and so I don't have that in a way. Like I like good tasting food, and the, mm -hmm. now that I've gone, there's like there's some certain, certain stuff that I wouldn't eat. Like I hated onions. Uh, pe peppers, any of that type of stuff. I never now like I I can't get enough of it because it, there's so much flavor in the food that I eat now. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's like opened up a whole new world of of actual flavor as opposed to uh, a burger and French fries. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, which is shit. I ate burger, French fries, and chicken wings in college, and I was mm -hmm. a high end college athlete, right. and I was eating shit food. Yeah. Pizza, chicken wings. You know, and then they like, well, you know, you got a carb load, so we go eat a bunch of pot. You know shitty mm -hmm. white pasta and, and, and sauce and thinking that we were doing something healthy for our bodies. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think everything's changing. People's mindsets are changing on what, what true nutrition is, but I still see some stuff that's being pushed out there. I mean, our, the stuff that our government pushes out is our, you know, what we need to eat is, is that that pyramid is gone. Mm -hmm. in my yeah. yeah. The food pyramid. Yeah. Yeah. The upside down food pyramid. Right. Right. Uh, we got Cliff coming in next in a little bit. You coached him for a long time. Yeah, Clifford Starks. Cliff is is a uh, Cliff is a different person. Let's put it True. that way. Kid came out of high school, um, was like a state champ in the yeah. shot put or something. Yeah, and maybe the hundred something like that. Maybe. I grew up with Clifford. So Did you we really? Were like elementary school man. Oh, I didn't yeah, know that. Yeah, one so. of the nicest people I've ever right. met in my life. Right. And, and he's this kid that comes up and he's like, hey, coach, how you doing? <laughs> yeah. like, hey, and even to this day, like, he's like, hey, coach, just the nicest guy. You'd have no idea. That, right. Like, when they said he was going to fight, I was like, Cliff? Yeah. Like, uh, well, people would say that about me, were. and I can be a complete yeah. asshole. I don't know about how Cliff is. Like, right. I don't know how he's a fighter, and he was a stud. Right. Mm -hmm. But was just a, one of the strongest dudes I ever met. We came into ASU, walked onto our program. I think he was maybe a two-time state champ. Yeah. Um. He's always been like a beast. Just at, I remember being on the playground as kids, man, elementary school, and we would play like football, mm -hmm. just throw kids around. Just mm -hmm. a man amongst Te boys. Yeah, it was ridiculous. <laughs> but not tether, a mean tether ball. Body. No, he was not. It, no, not even like that. Mean tether ball game. Tether ball. It'd be like one hit. It would just <laughs> and you'd be out. Like, yeah. oh, dude. There's actually. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of like Bo Jackson, uh, Paul Bunyan type Cliff stories from high school. One of our, one of yeah. Matt and I's mutual friends, Gabe, who, who's a, yeah, he's a sports got agent. Too. He yeah. said with football, it's like Cliff could go out there and kill people, but you had to motivate him. Like, yeah, you'd be like Cliff, go get number fifty. All right, and yeah. you just smear him, but. Yeah. Nicely. Yeah. You know? yeah. Or I believe he was uh, the state 
state record holder for shot putt. And the story is like, m- and only like two hundred and five pounds or something. He wasn't yeah. a monster. Or yeah, anything. yeah, just very developed. Just, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think we all had those friends in high school where, when we were all still little boys, they were somehow men. He's yeah. at that natural, yeah, natural strength. Yeah. Like even yeah. in the weight room. Yeah. Yeah. But the shot putt story is natural. they were like, Cliff, hold this up to your chin and just throw this thing. As far as and he yeah. pitched it like in practice. They're like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. well, that's the state record. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> no, no. That, that was like me. often Can in practice. He'd be doing things like that. Yeah. Can you do that on Thursday? Thanks. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and that was at Mountain Point, right? Yeah, Mountain yeah. Point. Yeah. My buddy, I think Mike Douglas was coaching my college roommate. I think he coached him at, at, at Mountain Point a little bit. He was an mm-hmm. assistant there or something. Mike was. Mike's runs Thoroughbred now, that, which is their kids' wrestling club, one of the best clubs in the country right mm-hmm. now, in, out of Chandler, um, with Eric Larkin and those mm-hmm. guys. But, yeah, Cliff. So Cliff came into ASU and was behind, was a heavyweight, but he was behind Kane Velasquez. Yeah. Kane tr- was, was a transfer from a junior college after winning a national title at Iowa Central. I'm going to switch stories real quick. Iowa Central un- uh, Junior College, John Jones, Kane Velasquez, um, Colby Covington. These are all guys who were at junior college that are all uh-huh. UFC champs at one time. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Crappy little Iowa Central. And then I think they had a couple other guys going there that maybe fought in the UFC. So really, that might be the, the number one. What are they mm-hmm. eating out there? Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> So Kane Corn. came came Corn. to ASU, and and no one really wanted to train with Kane because he was so intense. So we'd put Clifford with Kane because he was somewhat you know sized, and Kane would beat the shit out of Cliff, and Cliff would stand up and get right back in his face. I think CB CB would tell me stories about that too. Oh, it was insane. Yeah, yeah, he would. Yeah. Be, no one wanted to work He's out like with him. The, and yeah. then and of course and then and it really made Cliff a lot better and Cliff ended up qualifying for the NCAA tournament one year because Kane was ineligible or, or red shirt or something I can't remember the whole situation but um, Clifford stepped in would place third at the Pac tens and then went to the NCAA tournament won a couple matches and mm-hmm. and and Kane really made help help develop Cliff you know because. Yeah. He wasn't he wasn't uh, technically maybe there as much as as the others are size wise and he wasn't cutting a ninety seven and beating Bader out mm-hmm. so he was gonna have to go up and it was pretty yeah. cool awesome well hey I think we did it I think we did a good job today I think we learned a lot um, what did we learn we learned a bit about shoulders yeah. we learned uh, yeah wrestlers are filthy and need to be careful watch, and watch out for skin things I wouldn't know. say wrestlers are filthy don't be putting that shit out there that's <laughs> what happens in the jiu jitsu <laughs> world like oh wrestlers are dirty at least for <laughs> a few hours a day wrestlers are filthy yeah. and, uh, <laughs> and, and at night there's some <laughs> nights where wrestlers are and we, filthy too. even those of us just doing jiu jitsu and stuff it's like we gotta watch out for this 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 three pronged problem which is skin problems injuries that, that you don't know how you got right. and having a tough mental attitude you you also have to be careful you know yeah so hey aaron if people want to connect with you for like let's say real estate out here i know that that's what you do now yeah um do do you love it do you love doing real estate i know a lot of people who do really love it i do i think it it is it's such a unique job but it fits me because i'm not a nine to five type sit behind a desk Mm -hmm. you know my whole life's been wake up work out be there at 3 30 do another workout you know have kind of an open schedule of things so like i just mentally can't couldn't put myself behind a desk mm-hmm. um so this allows me to do that and allows me to be pretty free and i also i'm, I'm somewhat personable so I, I i don't mind it's cool getting to work and and and, and meet other people and kind of mm-hmm. you know as long, as long as they're not complete a-holes and i can think right. we talked about but uh well, a lot of the hours too is late night you know your clients are getting home at five I'm, I know I'm on the phone constantly with them. That's my business hours are usually they're odd, you know. And I'll answer clients back at like 10 p.m. Me too. I'm like holy and shit, I didn't mean for you to. I'm like, hey, I'm up. Yeah, I yeah. Can't stop I'm, thinking I'm anyway. And, and I think as a as a as a client, you would appreciate knowing that you're that you've got a guy that's on call that can answer your questions and do stuff. So yep. hey, I'm, I'm the same way. Answer I mean, your I, phone. Work yeah. hard. Say what you're going to do. That's exactly. Yeah. Follow yeah. it up. And yep. the, and I and I've met some realtors that don't do that. It drives me insane. Yep. <laughs> but yeah. No. I'm enjoying it. So yeah. I mean, you know, I've got a, a my my email is is the t h e coach simpson at gmail dot com. So mm-hmm. um, and uh, Instagram at coach aaron simpson. Yeah. So at coach underscore coach underscore aaron simpson. Aaron simpson. Easy to find. Yes. Yeah, easy uh, to find. I'm around. Great. Well, thank thanks for joining us today here on Busted Fighters. I think we all had a good time. We learned some stuff. And we'd love to have you back sometime. Yeah, it'll uh, I'll, I'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe with a new injury. All right, thanks. Everyone, guys. wash their hands. <laughs> yeah, yeah. wash <laughs> your hands. Stay clean, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'd like to thank Aaron for joining us. I think we learned a bunch, and I hope you did too. You can find him very easily on social media at Coach underscore Aaron Simpson. 
And I'd also like to thank our sponsors, Dark Horse Lionheart and 48 Real Estate, the Beard Estate Agents. Talk to you next time.